Welcome to Adoption Roundtable, a place to encounter the latest adoption research, policy, and practice in an accessible way. This is a space for adoptees, adoptive families, birth families, and adoption professionals. I'm Dr. Emily Helder, a clinical psychologist, researcher, and professor at Calvin University. I am also the co-editor of the Rutledge Handbook of Adoption, along with Dr. Alicia Marr and Dr. Gretchen Robel. In season one of Adoption Roundtable, we'll be having conversations with the authors of chapters in the Handbook of Adoption. They are top international scholars in a diversity of fields, and together we'll talk about their work and what it means for understanding adoption. Hello, I'm Dr. Emily Helder, and I'm here with Dr. Bibiana Coe, who's an associate professor and MSW program director, as well as the Betolden Scholar in Applied Ethics at Augsburg University in Minnesota, as well as Dr. J. Ron Kim, who is an assistant professor and BSW program director at the University of Washington in the School of Social Work and Criminal Justice program as well as Dr. Ruth McCroy, who's the Donahue and De Felici Professor Emerita at the Boston College School of Social Work and a research professor on the Ruby Lee Peister Centennial Professor Emerita at the University of Texas at Austin School of Social Work. While they all each have well-established individual research programs, we're gathering here today to talk about a chapter that they co-wrote in the Rutledge Handbook of Adoption entitled Adoption-Specific Curricula in Higher Education. So thanks so much, all three of you, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so I'd like to start, uh, the, the framework that your chapter really rests on is this idea of adoption competency and increasing access to adoption competent professionals. And I wondered if you could start by just describing what's meant by adoption competency and why access to these kinds of professionals uh, are so, is so important. Of course. Yeah, adoption competency in the literature is defined as educated, licensed mental health professionals with the knowledge, skills, and expertise, or excuse me, experience to work in adoption. That definition has been expanded in terms of it defining the education and training um, of adoption practitioners that reflects a diverse and complex range of developmental issues. Um, we understand the, that this is how the literature defines adoption competency. Um, we also caution people to think about competency as not an endpoint. Um, and so in some ways we question this idea of competency much like um, the literature will talk about cultural competence. And the reason is because adoption is moving so quickly rapidly changing and to truly be knowledge, knowledgeable and have expertise in this area, you really have to be up to date um, in terms of changing trends, demographics, issues, etc. And so um, again, we acknowledge that it's defined this way, but we also do not want adoption professionals to think of their necessarily as being an endpoint and gaining some of this expertise as it's defined in the literature. And I know Jadon and Ruth may also want to add. Yeah, I totally agree with Bibiana. This is just adoption is sort of what I call an ongoing process. There's so many things, so many to look at. There's so many different types of adoption. Are we talking about transracial or intercountry or inracial? Are we talking about open adoptions, mediated contact adoptions, closed adoptions, just, just an array of topical areas to be explored in adoption. So it is something that it's, there's no uh, beginning and end, there's a beginning and we're moving through the process of learning more about each of these areas. And there's so many different components of adoption competency today. Yeah, I, I would agree. And, and I think uh, more recent uh, research that's been done in the past decade, especially shows us that um, the, the topic areas we need to increase our competency around have have um, expanded. So I'm just thinking right now about a lot of the work that's being done on LGBTQ families, on um, 
adult adoptees, on ongoing relationships between first families and adoptees and adoptive families when adoptees become adults. Um, there's some research now around grand, um, like birth parents who are now grandparents because the adoptees have children and what those relationships are like. And so in order to be competent and to increase our competency, we need to, we're, we're also following what the research is showing us as well. Yes, yes, it was so interesting to work on the handbook and see all these new topics and aspects of chapters as they came in. One I was really interested in was um, the impact of social media on search um, efforts, as well as um, some of the direct to home DNA testing. So there's, yeah, there's just so much new all the time. Yeah, I wanted to um, talk a bit too about how your um, how your your study was actually conducted and and aspects that you learned from it. So, um, just for for folks who haven't read the chapter yet, the uh, the things that you were reporting on were from a survey where you were collecting data from faculty who were teaching adoption relevant coursework uh, in a variety of different fields and settings. And you outlined also uh, some of the postgraduate certificates uh, that are currently available. And again, you know, you, you all emphasize that really adoption competency, there's not an endpoint. So thinking about it as something that does develop over time, I was curious what sorts of things you would like to see um, undergraduates exposed to, you know, what things are they ready for versus graduate students. Um, all, all of you have been involved in education in, in both of those settings. So I'm curious to hear what your experience has taught you. Yeah, so uh, as we were, the three of us were discussing this question, um, you know, we thought, well, we'll start with the undergraduates. Um, we believe that one of the things that they really need to come away with is just understanding how complex adoption is. And so oftentimes, um, I think what people come to it is their own experience with adoption, if they have any kind of personal experience, um, if they're an adoptee or an adoptive parent or have a sibling who was adopted or a friend. Um, but understanding that adoption is way more complicated than their own personal experience might, might have led them to, to know at that point. Another thing we think undergraduates should really come away with learning about in their programs is um, the ethical considerations around adoption and that there's a lot of ethical dilemmas that are really directly uh, part of the adoption process and adoption fam adoptive families and to, to understand kind of all the different um, kind of ethical dilemmas that can be involved um, in an adoption. And then the historical context we thought was really important. So understanding the history of adoption, especially in the United States, how it started, what it's looked like, the shifts in practice over time. Um, and so also related to that to different policies and the adoption laws that have governed how adoption is practiced. We think those are kind of the fundamental things that undergraduates should, should learn about. I was just going to emphasize um, in terms of what Jadon added um, that we thought that the, the larger framework for what we think is important for undergrads, we would probably echo that for graduate students as well. Um, and I just wanted to highlight one aspect in terms of the second point that Jadon talked about in the importance of ethics in adoption and how so often it is more implicit then explicitly discussed. And we think it's really important to develop that foundation, particularly at the undergrad level um, in understanding ethical issues in adoption. Well, just building on that, there are so many topical areas that we need to have. I can recall starting out in the field of adoptions, uh, placing infants and having never taken a course on adoptions and understanding what the implications are of a family adopting an infant an infant comes from two of a set of birth parents who knows information about them the, in terms of what are the issues in terms of identity and how do you connect with birth parents. So much uh, of the issues that I noticed, you know, that people did not know about, frankly, at that time. And how do you begin to look at some of the developmental issues over time, dealing with grief and loss of a child that is coming from one set of parents going to another set of parents. 
How does the child adjust? How do you begin to communicate about adoption? There's so many different issues. And I recognize that when I began this process of placing infants, I'd had no training in any of this. And there's been an evolution over time of additional knowledge as we've gotten involved in much more research, but still so much more is needed to fully understand. And we will need to continue this process uh, for many generations to come because there's so much new that has, no, so many things have changed. We used to have a totally confidential adoptions for many years. Now there's so many fully disclosed open adoptions. Things have changed. How do we learn from the knowledge that we gained? So it's, it's essential. Yes, thank you, thank you. In thinking about how, you know, as students enter into their graduate training, are there additional topics or experiences that you see them ready for at that stage of training? Well, I, I mean, I think that when we're, there's, it depends on um, which field you're in and what you're learning. So I think if you're going a clinical route, I think really um, expanding more on the concepts around grief and loss and working with the adoption constellation. And, you know, I think as a general undergraduate concept, understanding the adoption constellation is, is critical and, and a key understanding there. But as um, you enter into more clinical work, if you're going into a graduate program, then thinking about what that looks like for all these different members of the constellation and how expansive um, these connections are. Um, as we were talking about before, um, you know, we are now understanding that through these DNA um, tests, direct to consumers, you're finding first cousins and uh, aunts and uncles and not necessarily what we would think of as the birth family itself. Um, and so these relationships, separated siblings are finding each other. And so really having a a good understanding of that those clinical implications I think for graduate students would be um, really critical and then I think from the social work field if they're going into uh, maybe child welfare they're going to be practicing at an agency whether it's a, a public agency or a private agency there's numerous practice considerations that I think um, can go much deeper and further in a graduate program thinking about those practices and um, you know, how do you determine what the best interest of the child is in, should they be placed with siblings or not in an adoptive home or um, recruiting um, families for older children? Um, you know, so, so I just think there's a number of practice implications that we can really go much deeper in for the graduate students. So I would also like to ask you a bit about postgraduate um, certificate program. So in, for example, in our handbook, we have one uh, that's described in more detail, the training and adoption competency put um, by CASE. And I was curious, are there aspects of adoption competency that fit best within these more postgraduate certificate programs? Yeah, we think that those programs are really important. We know that the, um, as you mentioned, CASE, the Center for Adoption Support and Education, provides that. Also, there's a certificate program of adoption that Rutgers University, so continuing education program has offered. I think more and more schools are beginning to look into this because there's a need for deepening adoption knowledge and skills. And there's so much, you know, you may take an initial course in undergraduate or graduate, but there's so much more information out there, especially based upon some of the research that has been conducted. So we think that it's critical that there be a, a focus on this topic, that in some of the Title IV-E programs, that there's, we enhance the education of both graduate and undergraduate programs. Uh, students focused on permanency, how to achieve permanency, uh, the various strategies, what we've learned, looking at the research outcomes. This is really important and to recognize that it doesn't end with the completion of one course. We need to have certificate programs. We need to recognize and look at the data on an annual basis of what's happening, how many children are being placed, how many children are aging out without a permanent placement. What are the implications of that? What can we do to reduce those numbers? We need to be always looking at the data and thinking about what the implications are to make 
staff much more adoption competent and to be much more successful in finding permanency for children. I'd like to add that I was part of putting um, a post certificate program um, at the University of Minnesota. And one of the things that I learned and um, really came away with is how these postgraduate certificate programs um, oftentimes have an element of case consultation. So many times these are practitioners who are coming to deepen their knowledge, but also I think deepen their practice skills. And by doing case consultations, uh, undergraduates may not have the opportunity to bring in a current case from their field practicum, but um, practitioners out in the field who have had you know, any number of years um, certainly are dealing with those more comp complex cases. And so I think these uh, postgraduate programs can really um, be terrific for that. And um, that might be something that maybe graduate programs can, can think about adding in more elements of that if they wanted to you know, enhance the, their, um, this content in, in their classes too, because you know, I think there's lots of opportunities to, to add more of that in, into our undergraduate and graduate programs. Yeah, and I would just love to add is um, Ruth and Jadon have underscored the, the post, um, the post degree training is really a way of deepening knowledge. And in fact, one of the reasons we love this question is because it was what, what brought the three of us together and to do this study was the lack of um, adoption curriculum in higher ed. So uh, I just wanted to add that. Yeah, thank you. And that's where I wanted to head too, is just uh, one of the takeaways I had in reading your chapter was really the, the limit of uh, adoption related coursework that, that there's actually very little. Um, and, it, and that fit well with my own clinical training, to be honest, too. Um, and so I'm curious if you could talk through a bit of some of the factors that you think are contributing to that from your perspective. Yeah, we actually, when we talked about and thought about this question, unfortunately, we came to more barriers than anything. Um, one of the things is in our study, um, uh, one of the study findings too, was how the vast majority of programs um, in undergrad or graduate are actually taught by those who have a connection to adoption, which is generally how coursework ends up landing in undergrad or graduate programs. You know, maybe they're an adoptee themselves, they're an adoption researcher, et cetera. Um, so part of it is those that might have the expertise and knowledge in an ever-changing complex field to be able to teach such a course. Um, the other thing is that in professional studies, um, and certainly the adoption curriculum is extremely interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary, um, but in professional studies, there are accreditation processes that I think also create a certain barrier where those national accreditors, um, for example, in social work, um, CSWE, are saying that programs, um, people need to graduate at the undergrad or graduate level having focused in these particular areas. Um, so those are significant barriers that um, will need to be addressed to be able to expand um, coursework at the undergraduate and graduate level. As you looked at some of the syllabi that came as a part of your study and, and were able to look at the topic areas that were addressed when there were places that, that had this coursework, I'm curious if you felt like there were some topics either that were missing or were addressed with um, insufficient detail that you would give advice for folks who are maybe developing coursework around adoption. Um, yeah, so I think one of the things that we found too is that there was a um, there were discrepancies between those that focused just on adoption and those that were on larger child welfare, where adoption was a prominent theme, but it may not have been the only one. And so there were some differences there, and certainly the amount of attention you can devote to a topic if it's a broader class than if it's a broader permanency class, it may have less an adoption than just an adoption focused. Um, syllabi. Um, you know, some of the content we saw was communication and processes related to the different types of adoption. So 
um, many of the syllabi talked about, you know, what are open adoptions, what are closed adoptions, what are international or what are foster care adoptions. Um, and then talking about, um, you know, same race adoptions, transracial adoptions, LGBTQ, but some of the things that we also felt needed maybe more attention were again, uh, kind of the ethical dilemmas around adoption. Um, so some of the some of the syllabi did talk about ethics a little bit or include that as a topic area, but um, not much information about how you know how deep they were going into that. Um, something that's maybe kind of newer, and this again goes to keeping up with the research, um, is around microaggressions. Uh, specifically related to adoption, and there's been some more research around that, especially in the context of transracial and transnational adoptions. Um, also thinking about um, transracial, transnational adoptions as migrations. Um, thinking about uh, in foster care, um, recruiting um, families, um, kind of reducing the wait times for permanency, um, multiple placements. I think the other thing um, that uh, I'm seeing in my own research too is um, talking about disruptions and dissolutions from adoption. That's something that wasn't talked about very much in the past, but um, is increasingly becoming a reality. Um, so more content around those areas. Thanks so much. Ruth or Bibiana, anything that you would add to? Yeah, I just agree. These topics are so important and I do a lot of work with um, Adopt US Kids in which we're focused on trying to find permanent homes for the thousands of children that are waiting here within the United States. And the question is, how do we better prepare pra future practitioners to be able to do some of the things that we were just talking about, whether it's recruiting families, what do we do about reducing the number of times children move from one home to another I've read cases in which a child may have, you know, within one month's period of time, may have gone to several different homes and over a year, you know, multiple homes. What can be done thinking about the implications of grief and loss for that child who's moving from one environment to another? How do we better prepare families? How do we not only prepare families for bringing in children, but how do we prepare children for adoption? And many of them have still a lot of um, connections to their birth family, to birth siblings. They may have all been separated. So how do we address some of those issues and really focus on improving outcomes for all of the parties involved? Thank you. Yeah, I um, am making a syllabus right now for a course I'm planning for next spring. So I'm taking uh, detailed <laughs> notes from all your advice. It, it's so helpful. Um, That's great. Yeah, yeah. As, as, you're, um, as you're thinking about the interdisciplinary nature of adoption, uh, one thing that I saw in, in the chapter was that the, probably the majority of coursework that was available was in the context of social work, housed in social work programs. Um, and I'd like to think through sort of the, both the benefits of that, what, do you see, what are some of the positive aspects of that being the primary spot where some of this coursework is housed, but also um, are there fields or programs that you can identify that you'd like to see grow in terms of what coursework they're offering? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that social work uh, practitioners currently are some of the, you know, the primary professionals that are really facilitating adoptions. And we have a lot of social work students that go on to work in child welfare agencies, or they may go into private agencies. Uh, some go on to become clinicians. They may be uh, working in school settings as school social workers and a lot of times they'll come into contact with children that have been impacted by adoption there. So they may be counselors, school social workers, they're often working in uh, child welfare agencies, they may be involved in uh, uh, recruiting families, trying to prepare families, there's just a variety of, of opportunities for positions in this and it's because a lot of the um, faculty within the field of social work 
uh, sometimes do have interdisciplinary connections with psychology and sociology and child development. And as a result of that, they're able to uh, really encourage various fields to incorporate content on adoption in their courses as well. Uh, it's really important to think about the fact that within our field of social work, we tend to look at the context, the environment in which children and families come. And that's different sometimes from psychology. And so to be able to bridge the two together and not looking at just the individual, but the individual with being impacted by multiple systems and what the implications of that may be. Yeah, and I would just love to add that another, I know when I talked earlier, Emily, and you were asking about existing curriculum in higher ed, and I talked about the barriers, here's an example of where the fact that so much of the curriculum is currently housed in social work programs, the benefit of something like Title IV-E um, in terms of expansion, um, if the, the most of the coursework is in higher in social work departments, then the nice thing is that there's also this opportunity to make a barrier, something that to, to work or to counterbalance barriers to maximize expanding potential under Title IV-E. But I know that's an area too of Jayon's expertise. So I don't know, Jadon, if you wanted to add about that. Yeah, I was really fortunate to be at a university where um, I was uh, asked to create a, an adoption and permanency course for 4E students. And it was open as an elective for any of the social work students, but it was a requirement for the 4E students. And so in addition to their general child welfare course, that was a requirement, they also had to take this permanency class. Um, and I, so I just think that that could be a, a terrific model for all the other programs that have 4E relationships with their state agencies. We strategized earlier about that as being maybe a potential policy um, uh, response as well, but um, because so many students going into public child welfare are going to be dealing with permanency and adoption, and so having that knowledge before they get into the deep end of practice where they're thrown in with a bunch of cases where, you know, they may not have had any, any experience on it before would be, would be good. As you're thinking, you know, we're, we're kind of headed in this direction, but um, are there programs that you can identify that you think of as, as model programs? You know, maybe, you know, the example you were just describing is a piece of that, but um, if you could uh, either design your ideal program or maybe you're, um, you know, see a program that's already in existence that, that you think is doing a really excellent job, I'd love to hear your thoughts on who's already doing some of this best practice work? Yeah, um, first of all, I, I really hope that in terms of this best practice work and being a model for interdisciplinary work and adoption expertise and knowledge that we see more programs like this, but the Rudd Center for Adoption Research, which is led by Dr. Dr. Harold Grotevant in the Department of Psychological and Brain um, Sciences at the University of Massachusetts and Amherst is really an ideal model. It brings social work, it brings psychology, uh, MFT, all education, all kinds of disciplines, and it brings together practitioners, those who have a connection to adoption, researchers uh, in this very interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary model. And I know um, that my colleagues here will likely want to add more. As you mentioned, that of course is a wonderful program. I have worked with um, Hal Grotevon, who developed it since, um, since I was in a doctoral program at the University of Texas and he served on my committee. I began searching for people who had expertise in adoptions and I could not find anyone in my field, but found Hal in child development and we have connected for many, many years. Uh, and now he is at, at UMass and he does a wonderful program there through the Red Center by bringing in uh, future scholars in the summer to bring them together to learn about adoption issues, to develop research, to begin to connect with one another uh, with the goal being that in the future they will be able to continue to really improve our outcomes by doing research to learn more about 
what works, what doesn't work so well, how can we modify our practices to become much more effective and to do this on behalf of the entire triad. So that program is, 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 is ex excellent, no question about it. Yeah, it continues to be and bring and really highlights some of what has been learned over the years in terms of adoptions. I've been attending some of their recent virtual um, sessions yeah. that they've been putting yeah. online. They're just so excellent. So excellent. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. As you're um, thinking at maybe more of a macro level, um, we're headed in this direction anyway in, in what we've been talking about, but um, do you see some larger policy changes that could happen that would um, move forward some of the goals that you've been talking about related to adoption competency? Yeah, in terms of policy changes, when we think about um, Title IV-E, we think about it in terms of uh, the Council on Social Work Education, which is the accrediting body for schools of social work. Uh, maybe there could be some changes in terms of requirements for content. For example, Title IV, you could require that adoption content be included in a child welfare course, not just an overview of all aspects of child welfare, but to have some significant content on specifically adoption permanency. We've also thought about it in terms of CSWE modifying its educational policy and accreditation standards uh, that would include such competencies, including specific content that should be incorporated into a practice course, into a policy course, not just child welfare, but in many other, in research courses to begin to look at these issues. Um, we need a lot more research to be conducted that focuses upon adoption training needs. And sometimes we think about the training just being for people who are directly working in adoption, but there are many practitioners out there that will come into contact with somebody who has been impacted by adoption, whether it be a birth mother, a birth father, an adoptive parent, uh, an adopted child. And also it's important to know that the siblings of adopted children also are impacted. There's so many different ways in which this needs to be addressed. We need to clearly uh, do more research that looks at adoption training needs, that looks at to try to figure out how do we develop more expertise among a faculty in a variety of different areas, including social work, psychology, and other program areas on adoptions. What are some of the post-degree programs and how do we expand those? How do we have more conferences that specifically look at issues of adoption? We spoke before about the Red Adoption Conference, uh, the North American Council on Adoptable Children. They have an annual conference. Those are all essential to have this kind of content. How do we also, though, expand it to provide this kind of information throughout our curriculum because so many individuals going through training, whether it's social work, psychology, so many other fields, child development or going education, they're gonna come into contact with somebody who has been impacted by adoption and so often have not had any sort of concentrated study on the issue. And we, are, we have a lot more information out there now, more books are being written, more articles are being published. We need to make that information disseminated so that those that are out there who are, who are working in the field and outside of the direct field of adoption have knowledge about this very, very important topic. I, I agree. I just want to expand on that just a little bit. Um, in, in my experience, um, teaching the class that, that I've taught um, with students who uh, weren't necessarily interested in adoption per se in terms of their own practice, but um, had already in their experience worked with adoptive families or um, adopted youth or individuals. And so, for example, I used to say, if you're working um, at a residential treatment center, if you're working in schools, or um, one of the things that I think really we could expand on is the medical and health professionals, because um, just recently, again, I was hearing um, uh, adult adoptees talking about um, the stigma that they experience when they go in for any kind of medical treatment and um, having a lack of medical history, for example, 
um, or um, invasive questions about their adoption history, um, those sorts of things um, that I think a lot of professionals, medical professionals and healthcare professionals don't have that awareness or kind of understanding they're not really adoption sensitive. So that's another area that I think um, could really be improved if we want to expand what other fields are um, teaching adoption content. Absolutely. Thanks. Bibiana, anything that you'd like to add? No, I just, um, the conversation today has just really, again, emphasized the importance of um, kind of expanding people's knowledge and expertise across the developmental lifespan of adoption and in terms of how the people are impacted, but bookending not only undergrad and graduate, but also the um, post certificate programs and the RUD program to help deepen. But the foundation, we cannot stress um, enough, I think, and it was really why we came together to do this work, um, is so important uh, in terms of curriculum in undergrad and graduate for that matter. But mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Well, thank you so much, all three of you, both for contributing the chapter initially and also for setting aside some time to add some context to uh, that written work. Uh, I think it's so helpful for people to hear these messages about how complex adoption is and how it, the ever-changing nature of the field really requires this constant um, updating of knowledge. So thank you so much. Thank you for the Thank opportunity. You. Thanks for joining us at Adoption Roundtable. Please subscribe wherever you access your podcasts. We love to hear from you and have conversations about your reactions, questions, and experiences. We'd especially appreciate feedback if you have topics or questions that we could address in future episodes. You can find me on Facebook at helder.emily and at my website, emilyhelder.com. There you can sign up for my newsletter for the latest on adoption research and practice. Thanks for joining us.